All right, this is Dark Days Radio. I'm one of your hosts, Mike, and tonight I'm joined by Chig. How's it going, Chig? It's going pretty well, Mike. How you been? Uh, I've been chipper. I'm excited. Weather's getting warmer. Things are cool. Been playing some games, and I'm excited to talk today about a game, a horror heartbreaker, bringing back that classic series, a game called C.J. Corella's Witchcraft. I can't wait to get into it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this episode all week. So. I've, I've had this PDF for 20 years, and I'm ready to finally talk about it. But uh, before we get into that, um, I don't know, do we have anything else we want to talk about? Like a game up- update or anything like that? I don't know. What have you been playing? Well, tabletop-wise, uh, for RPGs, just a couple days ago I played Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Oh. Uh, it was fine, you know, cool people to be playing with, but uh, man, the second we got into a combat encounter, I was like, oh man, oh jeez. I've how much how much time in my life have I spent in D and D five E combat encounters? Probably an embarrassing amount. I mean, it's it's a real quick system, right? You just roll one D twenty and add your number, and then you know you hit or don't, right? That's all there is to it. Yeah, it's you just super gotta, simple. You just got to do that for twenty turns, and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, bring a book, guys. Bring yeah. bring a book. Wait till it's your turn. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, you know, I was actually thinking about that as well. You know. I ran, um, geez, like a decade ago, I ran Ravenloft in AD&D 2nd Edition. And say what you will about AD&D 2nd Edition, Chig. I know you've got a lot of opinions. We got tons of combat and exploration done every session. Because combat honestly was very fast. You know, especially when you have fighters who literally just run up, roll your Thacko, and then do your damage. You know, they don't really have that many options. Obviously, the wizard was, you had to do a little bit of negotiation for what the uh, spell actually did which was problematic but um yeah it was just a lot faster you know i mean second edition is my this is a game that i cut my teeth on it's it's my favorite iteration of advanced dungeons and dragons so i enjoy it your favorite iteration of advanced dungeons and dragons okay okay <laughs> interesting interesting caveat right there um but very cool. And actually, Jake, I think this... Uh, well, what, actually, what have you been playing lately? Let's uh, let's do a game update for you, too. Uh, we, My group has been on a hiatus due to being adults and having things going on. Uh, we started a game of Old Gods of Appalachia. We got about two sessions in, and then the guy running it had to have surgery, and then other people were out of town. And We're getting back into it next week, so looking forward to that. Excellent, excellent. Well, I hope uh, your friend is uh, doing better after that surgery. And um, that's actually quite fitting because we're going to be talking about Old Gods of Appalachia here on Dark Days Radio real soon. So it seems like you got some experience with it. I will bring my three or four sessions of expertise to the table when we discuss Old Gods. Superb, superb. And it's also great that we're talking about AD&D 2nd Edition because in this episode, we're going to be taking you back to the 1990s. Insert guitar rift here. <laughs> In 1991, Vampire the Masquerade was released. Over the next nine years, the gaming industry was inundated by horror heartbreakers, games that sought to ride the coattails of 90s vampire romances, The Crow's awesome soundtrack, Art Bell's Coast to Coast AM, and the blossoming of New Age shops. From this time of reckoning came a man with an idea. What if there was a game where witches were real? A game where they wielded magic in an existential battle for our very reality. That man was Gary Sibley, and this game is called C.J. Corella's Witchcraft. Wait, Gary Sibley? Wait, 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 wait. who's Gary Sibley? Oh, we'll get into that, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> The, the main guy who wrote this is, of course, uh, C.J. Corella, who uh, we've talked about on the show before, because last Horror Heartbreaker, we did Nightbane uh, from Palladium Books, uh, which he was the primary writer on. We did. So let's dive into the book, shall we? Yeah. The book, like many role-playing game books, opens with an introduction. It starts with uh, some interesting, entertaining opening fiction. It was, you know, a quick read. I enjoyed it. Uh, the protagonists are kind of assholes um 
the uh, long and short of it is a group of witches go to investigate a disturbance in the force. Um, I mean, essence, uh, and get their asses handed to them by a suburban mom who is turned into a snake cone, snake tongued Cthulhu demon. Mm. Uh, in their most desperate hour, when their backs are against the wall, the witches are saved by the by a more un- unified opposition group, the Chamber of Commerce. Dun, dun, dun. They're, they're not really the cha- Chamber of Commerce, but that is how they're described, which was uh, <laughs> amusing. I, I thought it was I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the introduction also includes a, a gender note that the book uses the masculine pronoun for even chapters and the feminine for odd chapters, which in 1996 was a surprising step forward yeah yeah i mean you know white wolf uh tried to use uh you know female pronouns a lot more uh in its books and this one kind of has an interesting way of doing it you know every other chapter uh i forget if white wolf was like every other paragraph or every other example they did it um sometimes it was just i think it was all female pronouns but um yeah, I, I think it's pretty good. You know, it's a lot better than, uh, if you remember, Cthulhu Tech, uh, which had three paragraphs, like this rant in the beginning of the book, how they're only going to use male pronouns. That's it. Just because. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That was uh, not very impressive. But uh, yeah, what do we got here in uh, in Witchcraft? And, you know, we, we haven't gotten that much setting other than like a little bit of inkling from the uh, the opening fiction. What else we got here? Uh, well, it's an introduction to a role-playing game, so it so in case this is your first role-playing book that you've ever picked up in your life, in which case, why are you starting here? Um, it has a what is role-playing section uh, where it defines role-playing as acting plus storytelling with gambling and imagination and creativity, and it also makes thousands and thousands of julienne fries. It's truly the highest form of art if you hmm. go by this book. Oh, yeah. Um but then it goes on to the core conceit of the game, which is printed right there on page 17. Um, what if you were a person gifted, capital G, with supernatural powers, or a mundane, capital M, who is familiar with the supernatural world? Hmm. These days, that's a, a real common conceit. That's, you know, there's a dozen TV shows with that. But it, in 1996, that it wasn't brand new, but it was still not the norm. I don't. I don't know. I guess yeah. We didn't have the TV shows at that point, but it was all over um, uh, the fiction. You know, the novel side of things. You know, we had Anita Blake. We had tons of like uh, P. N. Elrod. A lot of like paranormal romance was already started at that point, as well as like uh, urban fantasy really had already gotten its start, especially with. Um, Nancy Collins, who we we interviewed her on the show years ago, so true. Uh, in that regard, it was pretty common, but yeah, I guess I guess in the broader media, it was not. You know, other than like Kolchak the Night Stalker. And let's see, this was ninety six, so we're pre Buffy, uh, we're pre the Craft. Actually, we'll bring the, I had this in the notes later, but the Craft didn't come out for another couple months after this, and um, you know, we're we had like. I guess Kindred the Embraced came out at the same time, which kind of had, you know, obviously a similar conceit. So yeah, it was really, uh, it was, it was a bit ahead of the curve, not too much, but, uh, yeah, good amount. Right there on the bleeding edge. That's right. Speaking that's of bleeding where, edge. That... Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was about to say, that's where CJ C. Carell is always on the bleeding edge. <laughs> and speaking of where CJ Carella is, that brings us into chapter two, the setting. So it turns out that we are living in a material world. But there are others out there where, like, monsters and elves and angels and demons and stuff lives. It's a world of darkness, perhaps? Ooh. And if you can see or interact with these other worlds and their inhabitants, you're gifted. Enjoy that extra responsibility. Also, the current age is drawing to an end. A new one waits to be born. It's a time of reckoning, (gasps) you see. Yeah. So because of that, there are a lot more gifted who are being born. 
people who have mystical powers. Also, more monsters, because, you know, you win some, you lose some. Now, who are these gifted? They're the folks who can manipulate essence and use it to create magical effects. And what is essence? It's mana, or tau, or ether, or whatever. It's magic juice. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. It even has good and evil sides. Anyway, it's what you use to do magic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also, monsters and other supernatural creatures need essence to survive. So that's why they prey on people, for their sweet, delicious essence. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So talking about the setting, this book makes a very interesting decision. Um, it says that, uh, and this is a quote from the book, the monsters of myth and legend flock to the central cities of Europe and America, shunning the poor and primitive areas of the world where ancient lore has not been forgotten. In the heart of the world of reason, monsters lurked for centuries. Their crimes remained largely undetected and for the most part, unpunished. End quote. And <laughs> that's, uh, first off, you know, that's a little reductive, you know, saying that if it's not Europe, it's not America, it's primitive, which wasn't true in the 90s, definitely not true today never really been true you know obviously you know different places have different levels of technology and other things but um you know certainly uh certainly we shouldn't just brush them aside but this is actually kind of an interesting decision because uh Carilla's, you know he, he looked at this he said man which is they're all like eurocentric and uh, all the material i'm writing is based off of appropriate new age stuff so maybe i should just focus on western culture and this is you know while not well written an interesting way to say hey this is why we're focused on this area and why there's so many um uh witches obviously but also these creatures like vampires demons etc uh that are all focused in this one area because they're kind of hiding in the shadows of a a society or a culture that does not empirically see them so therefore does not think they exist to be fair that's also the reason that dracula went to london in the book because the people in transylvania knew how to keep vampires away but in modern england they didn't believe in any of that stuff so they would be powerless to resist him yeah that's quite fair that's quite fair but you have things on the other side where, um, and I think Eddie Webb has made this argument before, that let's say Victorian London was probably like the worst place for a vampire to go because, you know, it, it's, it would be the place that would be most scientifically progressive enough to realize that he existed or to track the uh, the patterns of attacks, murders, etc. Um, so, you know, you can go either way with this. Clearly, C.J. Carrillo's witchcraft went in this uh this area wherein uh he assumes that we're hyper focused on this area for this reason and that actually avoids despite despite the reductive sentence in here it actually avoids a lot of the problematic things that you find in other similar games uh wherein they they have reductive portrayals of uh, certain cultures um or you know just steal things willy-nilly from from particular religions etc so I think it's interesting, and uh, you also have to remember that this is the guy who wrote Voodoo Shadow War for GURPS, uh, which took a very, very different approach to uh, appropriation of uh, voodoo uh, religion and practices, and also cultures and, and global conspiracies as well. So I think you might have learned something. Perhaps. <laughs> but because this wouldn't be a horror heartbreaker without social clubs, uh, Chapter 2 also includes a brief rundown of the Covenants. Uh, we'll go into those in depth later, but they're basically how the Gifted organize themselves. So they're like traditions and mage, more so than clans and vampires. It's mostly something you can choose to join or not. And if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And there's even a little group for people who have not decided. Um, it also mentions that uh, 
they will call their cool powers in this game metaphysics although they very nearly immediately drop that name and refer to them as arts so yeah Yeah, i noticed that too uh I was like, okay, okay, metaphysics. And then they never use the word again until a chapter title later. Yeah, it's the chapter title where they cover the cool powers, but I I think those are the only two times that the word metaphysics appears in the book. Um, There are four uh, arts, uh, at least in the core book. Um, Magic, the sight, necromancy, and divine inspiration. Some are in opposition to others, and most of the gifted pick one, and specialize. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing, Chig. You know, we mentioned, you know, you, you don't know which social club you're going to choose, but of the uh, the five covenants that we have here, which we'll cover in more detail later, they're pretty much all focused on just one art. So, well, two of them are focused on magic itself. Uh, another one's focused on the sight, another one necromancy, another one divine inspiration. So there's not too much mechanical reason to not be in these. <laughs> There could be story reasons, but... Um, right, it's, yeah. it's for role-playing. And remember, right. role-playing is the highest form of art. We covered That's that in right. Chapter 1. Right. Speaking of arts, magic is the most versatile art. Uh, there's lots of different stuff you can do, but it takes a long time and a lot of hard work to learn. Uh, the sight is psychic powers. Um, you got to be born with it. Nobody can teach it to you if you didn't get it from your mama or papa necromancy is the ability to interact with the spirits of the dead that didn't leave the material world um you have to have some form of trauma to get this one which is usually a near-death experience so you come back changed and finally divine inspiration is um well it's kind of like clerical magic from D. uh you get your inspiration from a or the god and you are their fist here on earth so go forth and smite yeah i think the only thing i bring up with uh, divine inspiration is that uh one of the core setting conceits which i'm not sure if we mentioned is that all religions are true um they're just all a little bit true so theoretically divine inspiration can kind of come from anything it doesn't have to be necessarily Abrahamic, but uh well We'll see what happens with that later. Uh, That leads us into chapter three, which is titled Roles. Uh, It's the character creation section, and uh, it's a simple eight-step process. And I know that sounds facetious, but no, really, it's surprisingly simple. Uh, Step one, come up with a character concept. Uh, The the book provides several examples if you aren't sure of where to begin, but you should feel free to come up with your own. Or decide what character you are and what group you're a part of and then come back to this later. So sometimes it's easier to say, well, I want to be one of those divinely inspired guys. And that's your that's where you start rather than I want to be, you know, a guy who used to be a plumber. And now I hunt demons. Although that sounds kind of fun. Uh, Step two is uh, choose your character type. Uh, There are four choices. Gifted, Mm -hmm. who have magic powers. Uh, Lesser gifted, who have better skills and attributes, but not as good magic powers. So they still have magic, but not as much as the gifted. Uh, And then there's the mundanes, who are skilled, but have no magic powers at all. And finally, the bast, who are cat girls and boys cat people that I mean definitely a choice to include in your (laughs) game about regular people who might have magic powers hunting monsters I I don't get it but okay yeah they're they're in there well no I I mean it kind of makes sense so I think when CJ Crowley was, was designing this, he said, oh, man, you know, witches, they always have, like, that, that cat familiar, you know, Sabrina the Teenage Witch is on TV. Sometimes people just want to play Salem. Uh, so he decided to have these, there's two versions of Bass. There's the uh, the, the kind of lesser Bass, who's just a, a black cat familiar, basically, who can telepathically talk to everybody. Um, kind of a weird character. And then included these high Bass, because uh, he was like, well, how, we need these characters to, 
sometimes interact with uh, with human society more. So they can they're basically cat shape changers. They can turn into humans for um, it costs them essence, but they can they can you know for maybe like eight hours or something for a whole lot of magical power they can take a human form and walk around and do stuff. So it's it's an interesting choice. You know, it feels very very nineties RPG. Um, but I think that's really where it comes from is the cat Maybe. familiar. <laughs> I just thought it was you have guys with lots of magic, guys in the middle, guys with no magic, and cats. I just thought it was an inter- interesting choice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. It's definitely a more unique thing to witchcraft. That is true. But would I don't think I would allow the the black cat, you know, the lesser version that's only a cat in a game, because it, it's just it's going to just be kind of kind of goofy, you know, and won't be able to interact in the maximum way possible. It's a very limiting character choice. Yeah. Speaking of limiting character choices, that relates us to associations, which is where you pick your magic group. We got the Wicca, the Wiccan, the witch, they're, who are witches. Yeah. Uh, they're loosely organized into covens and groups uh, with no central leadership. We have the Rosicrucians, who are the magical upper crust, wealthy and wise. Uh, this is the uh, the magical, uh, what did we call them earlier? Chamber of Commerce that saved the, the day in the opening fiction. Uh, we have the Sentinels, who are robots who hunt mutants. Wait, no, um, <laughs> that's wrong Sentinels. Uh, these ones are, are warriors to protect humanity from the monsters. So kind of the same. Uh, uh, we have the Twilight Order, who are a group of mediums and necromancers who keep ghosts and other dangerous spirits in check. Uh, we have the Cabal of Psyche, uh, or Psyche, since this is the 90s, uh, which is a group of seers and psychics, which, honestly, I'm not really sure what it is they do beyond being a, a social group. And uh, finally, we have the Solitaires, who didn't want to join a group. Yep. Uh, step four, uh, you buy your attributes. The previous steps give you points to spend on these. Uh, They are strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, perception, and willpower. They are rated 1 to 5, and none of them are particularly mind-blowing in their definition. Although, some of them you use for uh, magic stuff. Yeah. Technically, you can can go up to 6 in character creation. It's just very expensive. But another thing to note is that uh, if you play a mundane in the standard points array here they can get most of their stats up to five just starting off right off the bat uh which is kind of ridiculous like they have they they have very good uh attributes just to start off with as opposed to the gifted and lesser gifted who have fewer points to uh to spend on attributes and skills but they get cool magical powers so that's how they kind of balance it it all balances out next we have uh step five where you pick qualities and drawbacks uh, it is a merit flaw system. Uh, there's some questionable inc- inclusions here, like minority is a one point social drawback. If you want to make the person running the game feel bad about role playing some racist NPCs, yeah. uh-huh. but it's mostly pretty standard, um, except for the supernatural qualities that you have to buy to actually have magic powers. It's weird that those aren't just baked into the type, but I guess this lets you play someone who is divinely inspired. And also a little psychic. Yeah, that's kind of the intent. It it, it makes it a bit finicky because you're reading through a uh, a character section. It's like, oh, you must buy this this uh, quality, or else you do not qualify for this. And um, it just makes it makes it a little annoying because you have to kind of go back and forth through the book, a little bit of spaghetti programming, if you will, to figure out how to build your character. It's the same thing that like Cthulhu Tech Cthulhu Tech did. Uh, in its character creation process, which was also kind of annoying. And the thing, (laughs) I think people at this point know how I feel about merit and flaw or quality and drawback systems. Uh, I don't like them because they're just highly gameable and there's always these kind of auto-include things if you want to build an overpowered character. What's interesting about Witchcraft is that it actually replicates design flaws that you find in World of Darkness games. So for example, there is a quality called Age, and it is so overpowered. It's just like free skill points, free essence, free magic points, and all that kind of stuff. Right. And you're playing an old, and that alone is a huge drawback because nobody wants to be like 
I don't know, in their 30s. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But the other thing is that uh, in witchcraft, your essence means you age slower. So if your character is 100 years old, you will probably only look like you're 30. Um, and the only penalty... Gross, 30, yeah, I know. The only penalty for taking age, getting all these freebie points, is that you have to take the drawback of either enemy or dark secret, which uh, don't don't do anything. They don't have any mechanical drawback, really. They just give you extra screen time to you know go toe to toe with your enemy, or maybe reveal that dark secret and have an epic, cool session revolving around that. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's not really a drawback. So basically, yeah. yeah, the drawback is you are the main character for this, at least for this character arc right. of the game. Right, exactly. So. Not much of a drawback. So yeah, basically, age is an auto-include. Um, and it's also interesting because they have this different quality called uh, past lives, which does kind of the same thing, except you aren't in the same lifetime. You're thinking back to like a past life as a, uh, uh, a, a, a carpenter or a, uh, a Napoleon or something. So... And that gives you some extra tiny bonuses, like extra skills, extra essence, and that sort of thing. But it's not as overpowering. And actually, you know, points-wise, it actually kind of matched up pretty well to other qualities and things. So I think I would say don't allow age and just go with past lives. Um, but again, you know, sim it, it, I feel like CJ Corella had Mage the Ascension open. It was looking through the merits and flaws. and was like, oh, yeah, I'll use that one. Yeah, I'll use that one. Yeah, I'll just make that the exact same thing. Yeah, Dark Secret, that sounds cool. And that leads us to step seven, buy skills. Uh, they're rated one to five, just like attributes, and they cover everything from beautician to smooth talking. If I have one real big complaint about the game, it's that there's just too many skills. Agreed. You know, I was, of course, thinking about this in the context of World of Darkness or Chronicles of Darkness, which have 30 skills in the game. I feel like that's too many, and this one has probably closer to 50. So a bit too much, you know, do we really need to have Beautician in there, Chig? I don't know. I mean, I get like, you know, you're trying to play a mundane character who maybe worked as a uh, barber or a uh, beautician or an esthetician or whatever, but that's just backstory. Does that ever, is that ever well, going to come up in game? Are you ever going to yeah, roll Yeah, I mean, you saw the mechanics skill? in there. If you roll positively for your Beautician, you can increase their attractiveness by one point, which can therefore make their persuasion better or maybe their seduction and that's one thing i want to bring up here chig which is the seduction skill because when you read it it lets you influence someone of any gender not just the opposite sex and you know what that means cue the music cj carolla wins the retroactive darker days progressive award of 1996 congratulations uh cj we're gonna send you a check in the mail and a ride on our private jet <laughs> guarantee not guaranteed and another note uh, there's actually, there's three melee skills, but in particular, there's martial arts and brawl, which do exactly the same thing in melee combat. But martial arts is just better because it lets you parry weapons. So why wouldn't you just take martial arts? Uh, because it is literally twice as expensive. Is it? Game balance. Oh. Yeah, it's a special skill. Special skills cost two, oh, two my points mistake. instead okay, of one. Okay, game balance. There we go. <laughs> All right, that's not too bad. I didn't catch that. Somebody thought this through. <laughs> CJ Corella winning the awards. All right. <laughs> the bleeding itch. Uh, and that leads us to the final real step of character creation where you decide on your metaphysics, uh, which are the four arts that we covered earlier. Uh, magic, psychic sight, necromancy, and divine inspiration. After that, you put on the finishing touches, like how old is your character? What do they look like? Uh, buy some possessions, and you're good to go. Uh, the chapter does include some archetypes, which was nice, but none of which really blew me away with their creativity, which is fine. They're they're supposed to be, you know, standard example characters. So here's a psychic guy. Here's a guy who has magic. Here's a gal who is, you know, divinely inspired. Perfect. That's that's what you need as a as a starting point. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd say is that these are kind of nice to have if you are you just need to like print out a character sheet for somebody and just give it to them to play a game. You know, you got somebody coming in for just one session. Um, that was my experience with Shadowrun back in the day. So they just printed off a, uh, a stealthy character for me and just said, here, play this, and uh, had a good time. So I think there's value to it. Speaking of playing the game, Mike, 
How do you do that? All right. Yeah, so I want to cover all of the rules here, but I want to give you a quick explanation of the uni system because um, that's actually used by several RPGs. Witchcraft was the first one to use it, um, and CJ Carolla designed it, but it was later used for things like Conspiracy X 2nd Edition, All Flesh Must Be Eaten, um, the Buffy games, and Angel. So it was used quite a bit, although Eden Studios really doesn't publish anything anymore, uh, but you can still find it in uh, some historical games. So how does uni system work uh for a complex task your character rolls a 10-sided die adds their applicable attribute and skill as modifiers and then also any modifiers from the chronicler uh these are usually negative modifiers you know it could be environmental things could be you know some kind of disturbance in the force i mean essence and uh anything like that you sum everything up and if your result is a nine or above the action succeeds um, and then if it succeeds by a whole lot, there's different success levels, which give you additional bonuses. You know, if you're like fighting in combat with like a melee strike, if you get m multiple success levels, you d just deal like extra damage, extra points of damage. Um, if you're persuading someone, you get a whole lot of success bonuses. Um, that could actually make it easier for you to persuade them later, uh, which I thought was a, a good idea for making social things a bit more interesting. Uh, it's, it's an okay system. Um, it kind of suffers, I think, because there isn't a lot of granularity for the uh, D10 versus the you know attributes and skills that you might have. You know, we mentioned that mundane characters could start with basically fives and all of their stats, so that's just a base plus five modifier. That's really good, um, and it can get to a point where characters are, if they're really powerful, there's not even much reason for them to roll, even on complex tasks, except for bad luck. So that's a little mechanic where uh, when you roll a 1, you then roll another d10. And if you get a 1 on f one through 5 on that, nothing really fancy happens. But if you get a 6 through 10, you get additional negative modifiers to your roll. Um, so that's kind of interesting because, you know, if you have bad luck, you could actually, even if you think you're going to succeed, you really might not. But it's not quite a critical failure where you roll a 1, you automatically fail or something like that. And there's a similar rule. F yeah, if you roll a one, you have a 50-50 chance of it being horrible. Yeah. And likewise, if you roll a 10. Yeah, yeah. If you roll a 10, there's a good luck, which is kind of the reverse of the uh, bad luck that I just mentioned. So that can mean, you know, if you have underpowered characters or you're going up and doing something nearly impossible, you might get that little extra boost uh, to succeed. But it's a pretty slim chance. But that's also good because we mentioned the skill or the uh, the success levels before, you know, getting that good luck, even if you already did succeed, can uh, give you an even further boost. So it's not quite like a critical hit, but it can be like a little bit of an edge to keep you going. So I think it's pretty good. It, the implementation is a little funky because you have to like consult a table all the time uh, just to make sure you, you translate your second role correctly. But uh, conceptually, I like it. I just did the math in my head and tell me if I'm wrong here. Rolling a 1 in 10 is a 10% chance, mm -hmm. and then you have a 50-50 chance of that going horribly wrong. Yeah. So that's 5%, correct? Yes. So it's a D20 But roll. it's not because there's different granularities to the good luck and the bad luck, right? So you can get a bad luck that is just an extra minus 1, I think. I'd have to check the rules again. And you can get a, a good luck roll, which is just an extra plus 1, basically. So... It could be. It could go horribly True. wrong. You could get a minus five or a plus five, um, but the probability of that is, you know, one in a hundred, one percent, basically. Right. Okay. So, I do like. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's not quite just a d twenty roll. Um, so you know, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it, but it could be implemented a bit better. It could be a bit smoother, you know. So anyway, uh, unit system. So for opposing rolls, uh, you just roll off against the opponent, and then you calculate the same way. Uh, but you find the difference for your success level between the two scores that were found. So, you know, you roll, you get an 11, your opponent rolls, and you get a, they get a 7, for example. That's a difference of 4, which would be a success of two success levels. So a slight little bonus. Um, and like many RPGs, there's a combat section, um, and it devotes way too many pages to guns. And there's some really weird things that happen with this combat system that I just want to highlight. Um, guns are 
kind of worse than they're definitely empirically worse than melee weapons unless you hit the target with a lot of bullets so that means you're going to have to roll every single shot whether it's with a semi-automatic weapon or even with a automatic weapon that you're like spray and pray or something like that you got to roll for every individual bullet which means that's going to be a lot of tedious multi-rolls in a combat turn and guns have this additional disadvantage where armor detracts damage from each bullet hit so you could actually have a situation where a leather jacket could block all the damage from a series of small caliber bullets which is you know realism right i mean okay it might not be realistic but it does lend itself to more cinematic or dramatic games than okay I know where the werewolf is, so I climb the clock tower across the street from his house and shoot him through the window with a silver bullet type of resolutions. Also, if using guns is harder mechanically, makes combat drag down, that is negative reinforcement on playing a gun haver. Yeah, that's true. I don't think he intended that, but... uh... You don't know that he didn't. Remember, CJ Carella is playing seven-dimensional chess while we're all over here playing CJ Carella's Witchcraft. So, CJ Corolla, international man of mystery. Um, also, yeah, cool. The game has a diceless slash card resolution option that's really not too bad. It just replaces the dice with a deck of cards. Uh, and then the chapter ends with how to spend experience points, including an optional spend experience points on stuff that you actually used mechanic that may be the first time something like that was published. Yeah, I can't think of another example in 1996 that had that. I could be wrong. Um, You know, obviously Call of Cthulhu uh, had its own way of increasing skills, but that wasn't really um, experience-driven. That was more just like, did you use it and did you fail during this game session? So I think that's pretty cool. There is an interesting little mechanic in here, which was uh, fear. You can sometimes do fear tests when coming across something that's really scary. Um, and if the character fails, it's basically a willpower test. They will freeze up, they might run away, they might go comatose, and they always lose some essence. Because essence is stored in the bladder. It's canon. Yeah, I think so. I mean, why else? A little, a little bit of essence leaks out when you get super scared. Yeah, that, pretty much. That's what I thought when I read it. But uh, yeah, I'm not usually a big fan of fear checks, and I don't understand why you lose essence for being scared, but uh, I guess Corella felt like the uh, mechanic was needed, and well, maybe it's okay in the game. And that leads us to Chapter 5, which is all about the associations. And just like it says at the chapter header, this covers the groups and covenants in more detail than it did previously. Uh, so it starts with the Wicca, the Wick, the Witches... Uh, it gives three separate pronunciations and notes that people can choose whichever they prefer. Ooh, yeah, uh, I usually say witches. Um, also kind of important to note here, and we didn't really say this up front, is that the uh, the witches in this game are not Wiccans in our world or in that world. Um, they are completely different. Uh, some of them do overlap. Some of them believe in similar neo-pagan uh, religious practices, but they are not necessarily and certainly not required to be the same. So kind of important. Uh, they, when we say uh, wiki here, that's spelled a little bit different than wicca. It's W-I-C-C-E, just for people following along at home. Um, and it gives some background and beliefs and organization information, which the beliefs Mike just covered very lightly. They are a group who is definitely not Wiccans. They are wiki wicca witch whatever you decide to choose um and these are the guys and gals that the game oh, really yeah. wants you to play they are painted in the best possible light uh they have not the most information because they they cover everybody fairly equally but these guys Absolutely. just scream these are the protagonists uh the group is organized very loosely into covens um which can be three or five or seven or 13 or but insert magic number here or insert Mm -hmm. number of players at your table here yeah they're they're kind of interesting um 
you know, there's a lot of different ideas that this section gives you. So you can be a, a group of eco-terrorists or maybe just individual. You could have neo-pagan cultists. And of course, you could be some investigators driving around in a van with their Great Dane. I wanted to uh, say that it was Oops All Willows, but it predates Buffy the Vampire Slayer by like a year. And I don't think Willow became like mm. an actual <laughs> witch in the show for several yeah, seasons. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what inspiration they were using for this uh i think there were some kind of like witch teenager movies before the craft in like the 80s but uh certainly this one's uh, uh it's got its own genesis i'd be interesting to, interested to know I, I i don't think it was based off of zapped <laughs> with scott bayo but <laughs> I, i'm not sure where the where the inspiration was drawn from possibly the uh the literary laurel k hamilton type stuff that you mentioned earlier I'd, I'd love to talk to cj Crow about this uh i think he's still active running novels and stuff maybe we can uh send him a message sometime we should send him a copy of this yeah. this episode oh yeah sure i i wonder if he, he might just just block us <laughs> block us immediately <laughs> but we'll see um so uh we should also mention that each of these associations has a cool special bonus, like a special ability, and sometimes a drawback. Um, witches uh, gain bonuses of uh, defensive magic, but they also get a negative modifier when trying to dismiss their essence. We haven't talked about the magic mechanics. Basically, um, it's more likely for them to miscast, basically. Um, it's worded kind of strangely here. I couldn't tell. It says that their miscasts or their dismissals when they have a backlash unintended damage are more likely they will always affect the attacker but i feel like they always affect the person casting the spell which is usually the person who's the attacker in this situation uh i guess maybe if you're like dismissing shield magic or something like that it would then affect the attacker that was uh or you failed to dismiss it would then affect the attacker using a spell against you or something I wasn't really sure. I was a little confused about this. I don't know, Chig, if you were able to uh, parse that a little bit better. Um, yeah, it's because a Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. That's where that rule comes from. I cannot... Or, you know, it might be one of those things like the this group is not the heavy hitter offensive group. This is the group that goes out there and tries to heal the damage that monsters and magic and other users of the art have uh have wrought so they're they're meant to be more of a uh reactive rather than antagonistic group so this is just a way of yeah. codifying that mechanically certainly the, the the jedi aspect that you just mentioned using the force for good is reflected later on and we'll discuss that i yeah i can see it going either way i kind of would like it if it was a uh you're great at defensive stuff but if you are going to use an offensive spell it's more likely that you're going to cause unintended damage like you have giant or at worse backlash uh, potentially because of your uh, uh your miscasts so or or failure to dismiss the essence i could see that being really cool um but I, yeah i'm just not really sure which way it goes could use an faq on this um you know I mean, 20, 28 not, years later. Not that it's super obvious, but it might be uh, drawing on like the rule of three, where whatever you put out into the world comes back to you three times. That yeah, that's which what is uh, the new age belief. That that is in, specifically mentioned in the uh, the dismissal rules later yeah. uh, so. in, in spell castings. I just don't I don't know which way this applies. Anyway, let's move on because this isn't good radio. Anyway, you know, after that. Radio, <laughs> the Rosicrucians, which is yeah. my favorite group because they seem to have their shit together more than any of the others. Right. Uh, yep. I, I want a group that knows what it's doing. I want a group that has clear goals and an in, a hierarchy to follow. These are my guys. Uh, and they are basically magic shriners. Uh, they are literally organized into groups called shrines, which have individual subgroups called cohorts yeah chig are you sure that's the only reason why you like them i mean the rosicrucians are a strictly hierarchical pyramid scheme that focuses on research into the nature of magic and specializes in the summoning and control of spirits 
Sounds a little Order of Hermes to me. Yeah, just like the Hermetics, they get stuff done. <laughs> also, it's yeah. not a pyramid, it's a triangle. <laughs> Fair. Fair. And, uh, yeah, the Rosicrucians, uh, their special ability is Invocation Magic, um, basically getting bonuses to controlling or banishing spirits or supernatural entities. Um, but they also have a drawback, which is that uh, they are taxed to quality points if they want to learn necromancy or second sight and they are not supposed to learn uh divine inspiration however speaking of divine inspiration the next group is the society of sentinels they're the army of god type folks uh it notes uh that most of the people in this group are mundanes who do research and stuff and only go into battle uh armed with their courage and mundane weapons as opposed to the cool powers so you got to respect them for that, I guess. Um, it goes on to say that they aren't all Catholics, but it really doesn't give any indication to back that up beyond, no, no, there, there's Jews and Muslims here too. I was, was reading the description. I kind of kept expecting it to say that, you know, the Jewish and Muslim members were all just busy out like shopping or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, this could have been like a really spicy place to discuss Zoroastrian sentinels or maybe Buddhists, but uh, nope, they're all just Abrahamic at the uh, at, at the best case. It's uh, slightly disappointing. They're saving all of those other blessed for the supplements, I assume. Uh, Chig, Chig, don't don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. Actually, right here in the section, it brings up that uh, the sentinels they really like and respect the storm dragons. And Chig, you want to know who the Storm Dragons are? Um, the Storm Dragons are... Uh, they're... I, I give up. What, who, who are the Storm Dragons? Well, they're introduced in the uh, Mystery Codex, which was already written when this uh, book came out, uh, but didn't see the light of day for quite some time. And the Storm Dragons are the Kung Fu Martial Arts Karate Eastern Mystic monster hunters Kiai. yeah but don't worry they have a grudging respect for the society of sentinels well yeah because they're objectively right being abrahamic obviously <laughs> doesn't say it in the book but it doesn't not say that in yeah, the book. it, do, it kinda, doesn't not say yeah. it very loudly <laughs> yep <laughs> uh the uh society organization used to be a familial um where, like, I hunt monsters because my daddy hunted monsters and his daddy hunted monsters and his daddy... Well, no, he was a he was a carpenter, but anyway. Uh, but it turns out that that isn't a <laughs> very good recipe for extending your bloodline because, you know, the monsters kill you before you have a kid and teach him how to hunt a monster. So now it's more of a monastic, holy calling sort of deal. I like that idea because, you know, it's, it's the trope in so many stories that, like... Oh yeah, we got like the monster hunter right here, but oh no, the monster's going after their family, and it's just like oh yeah, and uh, well that that kind of doesn't work out a lot, so <laughs> gonna need to hire some other folks. And speaking of other folks, these guys do not, as a whole, play very well with others. Uh, they see all of the other groups of not divinely inspired as practicing the forbidden arts and mm -hmm. potential tools of the capital E enemy, which means you know devils because you're using magic and that's devil stuff yeah yeah and this is where i get a little disappointed with witchcraft because uh you know i hoped that the game wouldn't fall into that splat trap of having all the different factions kind of despise each other um and several of the splats obviously just they don't like each other they have disdain for one another disdain especially for the necromantic splat which we're beginning to next um it can be a little troublesome but, um, well, we can discuss that more a bit later. But uh, uh, the other thing to kind of bring up about the Society of Sentinels, of course, their, uh, their special bonus, which is that they get a plus two defense roll against magical attacks. And uh, they don't have any drawback, but it's recommended that you make them really poor. I mean, yeah, because it's tough to keep a day job when your night gig is hunting ghosts because Jesus told you to. Yeah, so kind of like that. Sam and Dean in Supernatural until they get a sweet, sweet mansion house bunker thing i mean they were always hustling at pool <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Um, hey, speaking of forbidden arts, uh, the next group we have is the Twilight Order, which is a group of necromancers who want to help both the living and the mm. dead. Um, I kind of like the idea that some of the Ghost Hunter TV shows are actually these guys trying to do like community outreach programs. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. There's also an idea that they also try to debunk fake ghost hunters and mediums because uh, those are just con artists who aren't helping anyone, uh, which I think is uh, it gives them a nice little positive spin. Yeah. Um, it also noted that they do a lot of recruiting from mental institutions. It doesn't use that term, uh, but that's what it meant. Uh, because apparently if you tell people that you can see dead people, it's a good way to get yourself involuntarily committed. And that is even if you can prove it by talking to your doctor's dead grandma, I guess. Yeah, I mean, just because you can prove it doesn't mean that the Combine or maybe even the Sentinel Society um, aren't running the institution and want to keep you locked up anyway. Valid yeah. point. Um, they get along okay with most groups, uh, which includes the Sentinels, who they know probably don't like them very much because you roast dead forbidden art kind of guys yeah even the the uh, the witches the wiki don't like them that much either um but they they kind of want to work with everyone else which makes them kind of interesting they're kind of a uh i, I kind of like that you know they actually are trying to help people but they're just uh, a bit misunderstood they're yucky <laughs> that's that's all it is <laughs> they deal with yeah. the dead and that apparently yeah. is gross um yeah what else we got here a special ability of course uh plus one to all necromancy rolls no drawback so if you want to do necromancy you should probably join them but um maybe not there might be a better one <laughs> better potential one later on speaking of better potential the cabal of psyche are a pretty old group uh they say that they come from ancient greeks and dis are descended from the oracles uh but now they're organized into schools like literal psychic schools for perhaps gifted youngsters mm -hmm. uh they do psychic investigations for the most part but there's a rebel faction that uses their abilities to actively seek out monsters to fight yeah uh these guys have a really short write-up and i feel like corella was kind of running out of ideas here um i think there's mention of a lot of them being uh uh uh, like professors and other things so they they really have this kind of educational bent to them which it was kind of interesting. You could set something up like, um, oh, what was that? It was like, like the X Men, well, perhaps well, the X Men. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're very clearly well, the X Men. Yes, but you remember that? Um, oh, there's cool. the Friday the Thirteenth with like the Dream Warriors or something. I think that's like a third one. You could set up something like that, which has like crazy uh, psychic abilities and other things, and that's much less. That's a bit more sinister. A take for the uh, the Cabal of Psyche. And uh, for their special ability, they just get a free point in a seer or a second sight ability. There's no drawback. Running yeah. theme. No, no drawback. drawback. And finally, the last group is the Solitaires, uh, which is not actually a group. If you don't want to join a group, nobody's going to force you, probably. Uh, these are rugged individuals who go out and do their own thing. Some try to hide from their abilities. Others prefer to use them more openly, you know, drawing attention to the fact that, hey, look, magic, it's a thing. Um, it's less of a group and more of an etc. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, their special ability is that they can get plus one rolls in a specific art, be it magic, necromancy, second sight slash seer things, or even divine inspiration, technically. Um, so they basically have the same thing as the, uh, the necromancer group, um, the Order of Twilight, but more options to it uh one thing i note here is that it doesn't really lend the game doesn't really lend itself toward mixed group play so you could make it work probably but unlike world of darkness games where mixed clans or traditions or tribes are the norm it really seems to be pushing you to pick a single association and stick with it yes yeah i noticed that uh, a little bit too I, I mean this is a problem you can run into with like where with the apocalypse you could have shadow lords and uh uh solar fangs against each other or red talons just not working with anyone in classic uh werewolf uh legend of the five rings is notorious for having this problem which is why they need to have the jade magistrates as a uh, an option for people that want to have mixed groups which is like every group and also hunter the vigil with the different uh compacts and conspiracies you know you need to kind of come up with something 
a reason for them to all be working together. Uh, and that's not too hard to do, you know, a little bit of thought from the, uh, the storyteller, but you also need to make sure that the players are willing to play ball because if one of them really wants to be a stick in the mud in, you know, kind of derail gameplay, um, it, it depends on your group and everything, what they expect, but it can be a problem. This is why session zero and getting player buy-in is important. Mm. If you have a person at your table who says, well, my character would never run around with a Wicca or Wiki because they're evil and use magic, and that's not how what my character wants, then that person needs to make a new character who, who would interact with the rest of the group. Right. But that's a not an issue that uh, the game uh, was designed to cover. Correct. <laughs> Correct, yeah. And that brings us to chapter six, metaphysics. The last time you'll see that word in this book, because now it's time for cool powers. So we get the four arts described here. And again, those are magic, second sight, necromancy, and divine inspiration. Magic is a manipulation of essence. And where does essence come from, you might ask, as you would, Everyone and everywhere is a source of essence. You, me, that tree in the backyard, the witching hour, Stonehenge, everything is a potential source of magic power. And once you have some essence, what do you do with it? Well, a lot of stuff. Uh, Magic is the most diverse option in the entire book, which makes sense as it's called witchcraft, and witches Mm -hmm. use magic. Primarily. Yeah, and of course, two of the associations are focused on magic, right? You got the Rosicrucians and the uh, the witches. So I think it's good to have it be the biggest one. Magic, yeah, it gets the most extensive rules in the game. And um, it has the most invocation options uh, compared to uh, the other arts. These range from controlling different elements to opening portals to other realms or dimensions to cursing people and locations to uh, frying your enemies with built-up essence. So, with all these options, why aren't witches running everything? Well, it's because magic is mostly done through rituals. Rituals take time and essence, and if too many people are around, it gets harder to do. Though not really technically impossible to do. So, unlike in Mage the Ascension, just because there's some random dude walking by observing your ritual doesn't mean it's going to fail. Or that you're going to be penalized ridiculously for it yeah so there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to um make it more successful even if there's lots of people around which can be you know doing at a certain time of night you know like the witching hour or certain days like uh you know you know spring equinox for example uh and on the other hand uh you can group different uh beings together you know different uh it it could be other witches could be uh, you know, could have like a seraphim angel in there or something like that. And having that extra number can also give you some bonuses and boosts as well. Um, and like let, let you spend more essence, uh, which can definitely help things out. An important thing to bring up uh, about spell casting in witchcraft, we kind of alluded to is that, uh, there's no alignment or morality stat as you might find in other games, but there is a mechanical discouragement for characters to use magic offensively or vindictively. Um, If a character does, they must do a dismissal roll, uh, and they'll get some negative modifiers and potentially suffer some pretty serious backlash. Um, So it it mechanically says, ooh, you better be a good witch. Um, There are examples later on of dark magicians and things, and I assume they don't have this problem, or maybe they do and they just don't care. Um, So that's another thing to just kind of keep track of. You know, if you go to the dark side, well maybe you could be a bit more powerful yeah but i mean eventually the dark side will just you know eat you or it'll feed you to an evil god or whatever so you know it balances out in the end uh so that's magic and that leads us into the site or the second site which is esp and psychic powers and all that fun sort of thing um mundanes it mentions are more likely to accept this than any other art because science oh, i guess and yeah i guess they don't have the same uh people problem where with like the disbelief limiting their esp do, do they nope 
So if you use magic to, uh, you know, start a fire in someone's hair, that's affected by people walking around you. If you use the sight to cause someone to catch on fire, that's fine and dandy. Science. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the site doesn't use essence. It uses your own inner strength of will. Um, a kind of inner strength point, if you will. And what can you do with the site? Um, I'm going to go ahead and mention here a personal pet peeve about this section. Every single power in this category starts with the word mind, in case you forget that the powers come from your brain. And we have pre-existing terms like telekinesis. But why would you use that when mind hands is right there? And the answer is because mind hands sounds stupid. I think they should just get rid of anyway, they should just get rid of mind off of all of them. So one's just hands. That I would accept that over mind hands. <laughs> uh, anyway. But anyway, yeah, you, you get telekinesis and pyrokinesis and psychic healing and remote viewing and scanners, brain explosions and Jedi mind tricks, which is the one use of mind that I will allow uh, and remote viewing and psychometry. Uh, it's a lot of stuff, but obviously less than magic. Yeah, of course. I indeed. And I kind of feel like serial abilities, they have a lot of overlap with magic. Um, you know, they're cast differently, obviously. And they have some slightly different effects, but ultimately the game probably could have done without them or just introduced them as a uh, as a supplement, I feel, and given us a bit more in the uh, the magic section, even though it's already the biggest. Um, there is a neat mechanic, though, for Sears uh, to put their brains together for a super psychic power. So that's pretty cool. And even folks that um, are psychics but don't have that specific mind power can join in. So that's neat. I, I enjoyed the Gestalt rules. Uh, I thought they were pretty neat. It's kind of weird that more media with telepaths don't do brain linkage for extra power thing, because that just kind of, you know, one mind good, two mind better. Makes sense. Mm, yep. Babylon 5, Byron intensifies. <gasps> uh, that leads us to necromancy, which in this game does not mean raising undead armies to terrorize the villagers, sadly. <laughs> uh, it's more a classical definition where you talk to and can learn to manipulate ghosts. Uh, there are exactly four necromancy powers. There's death speech, which you can talk to the dead. Mm -hmm. There's death of vessel where you can let Patrick Swayze or, I guess, other ghosts, if you insist, <laughs> possess your body. There's Death Lordship, where you can command and control ghosts. And finally, there is Death Mastery, where you can do random stuff like pushing people's souls out of their body and see deathly auras or trap or exercise ghosts. Yeah, clearly Death Mastery is the really cool one. It is the super cool one, unless you happen to know Patrick Swayze. Ah, uh, right. Uh, each of these four powers have five sub-powers, but they're all real focused on their shtick. Yeah, I mean, necromancy is kind of just a hyper-focused and complex form of magic, I feel like. Um, you know, the spells are cast differently um, and intend to be a different form of metaphysics used by perhaps non-magical folk, you could say, you know, ones that just are, are blessed or cursed with this uh, ability. But, uh, you know, in another design space, um, these really could have just been additional invocations. I mean... I kind of get why they went this way. Magic already has way too much stuff in it. So they wanted to break this bit off. And it's like, it's also why you have to be reborn as a medium. Mm. So no amount of studying will get you there if you haven't touched death. Right, right. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I totally get it. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like a different design space. Um, and I'll bring that up next with uh, Divine Inspiration. But you know having this uh uh having everything as one mechanic would be kind of cool having all these different little mechanics going on it's a little bit extra to track um but from a conceptual standpoint yeah having esp and psychics be different than magic having necromancy be different than magic because it's you know obviously people that are not from specifically a magical tradition having it uh is is totally fine as well um so it's not really a criticism it's just like you know just a thing I'm noting. Speaking of getting to next, we have Divine Inspiration, the fourth and final gift or art. Uh, these are gifts from God, and you have to believe that you're fighting evil to use them. 
So you can't just smite a purse snatcher unless, I guess, he's also like a vampire or something. Uh, and for an all-powerful creator, God is really limited in what he'll let you do. There's like six discrete miracles here. You can be super strong. You can exercise spirits. You can pray for guidance. You can rain down some holy fire. You can lay on hands and heal someone. Or you can have divine visions. Hmm. That's it. Yep. Uh, I'm assuming that they expand on these definitely not magical arts and future supplements. But then again, it's not called CJ Corella's Smite Craft, so maybe they never expand uh, on these. I think they might. There's the Templars in, um, I think, the Mystery Codex, so they might get more Smite Craft kind There's of stuff. There's always the Templars. You can't have a game about conspiracies without Absolutely. the Templars. Absolutely. And it's, yeah, it's we're going to get the Rosicrucians in here, so... Yeah, you know, it's a logical expansion. Uh, yeah, a few, a few things I want to kind of note about Divine Inspirations. Um, they are really powerful. They're more powerful than Invocation Ritual Magic, um, unless you get a lot of people together to do these. Um, they're also a bit more immediate. You don't need a ritual, although there is a way to cast uh, Invocations, you know, like fast cast them if you have Essence Channeling. We didn't go into that, but it is a thing. Um, unless you're fighting supernatural foes openly using supernatural powers uh the rules kind of in introduce a bit of a mother may i situation uh where you have to be in desperation basically to be able to use these um and i, I don't like that too much um it would have been a bit nicer to get some more hints into how to use divine inspiration um because we only get like four short pages for these there's actually a lot of artwork in these in these pages for uh, divine inspiration so i felt like that that made them a little little lacking and i think more hints about how to use this in in dramatic fashion could have uh made the made it a bit more exciting for the game um rather than oh oh it's a it's a wild thing spirit okay i can just smite it with my with my god hammer or something like that um i also think it could have been interesting with these guys if you made it much tougher for them to use their divine inspiration that would have mean that these characters would use a lot more mundane equipment, guns, armor, cell phones, whatever, uh, as opposed to other uh, characters, other witches, or, um, you know, the, uh, the, the seers, uh, which could have made them kind of cool because, you know, they have less access to their magic, so they have to rely on other things to get things done in combat or elsewhere. I think it could have been cool if they kind of made that distinction. These guys might be the best um, lesser gifted option in the game. Oh, you're right. Because they don't need they don't need a whole lot of points to devote to their arts because there's so few of them, and that'll give them more points to spend on their uh, their attributes. Yeah, so great point. I didn't think of that. That's that's a good design or character creation recommendation right there. So we talked about the god botherers here let's talk about the supernatural stuff yeah it's partly setting chapter but mostly monsters um there's a very short history section here it's like a page and a half maybe two pages uh that's pretty standard urban fantasy stuff and basically goes over the things that went over in chapter one yeah. how there's a secret war there are other worlds it's a time of judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes into the monster section, and that's, like I said, the lion's share of the uh, the chapter. Uh, it's got ghosts. It's got nature spirits. It's got demons. It's got angels. It's got vampires with a Y. That's how you know they're evil. Mm -hmm. It has human servants of evil gods, and it has some black magicians. Yeah. Uh, a few things to... Did you like any of them? I, I do, I do. I think uh, there's a few things to highlight right here. So vampires are energy vampires eating essence and, uh, you know, occasionally blood, uh, but that's really more for the thrill of it. Because, um, you know, feeding off of a rush of emotions uh, for them or their partners is really how they gather this uh, this essence. And uh, they're not all bad, just the uh, sadomasochistic ones. Um, so, yeah. so hold on now. Hold on. I'm, I just thought of this. Right. If you fail a fear check, you lose essence. So does that mean that there are no vampires that feed on fear? 
that seems counterintuitive. Uh, well, it's a rush of emotions, so I feel like they could feed off of fear. But if you fail a fear check, your that essence just disappears, so they can't eat that essence. Oh, maybe they can grab it. It's gone. Know. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, you don't know where the essence whenever really you're goes. Afraid, I mean, if it comes out of maybe your... whenever you're afraid, there's a vampire around rubbing its little tummy. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be, just off camera. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, of course, there is an example vampire here. Um, who is not one of the good ones. Uh, to paraphrase, she's a, uh, she's a stripper serial killer. And uh, to paraphrase another podcast, she'll threaten your life, but not your sexuality. I believe that technically she is a spree killer, like most vampires. Mm. And, you know, a girl's got to eat. So I don't blame her for any of her life choices. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, witchcraft also includes angels and demons. And, uh, you know, I think they're cool, but uh, it kind of introduces a problem um, that the World of Darkness had, which uh, is that witchcraft says that elements of all religions are real, but then immediately injects a Christian focus into them with these uh, particular beings. Yeah, everything could be true, but some things are much more truer than others. Mm, mm, right. Clear. Gotcha, gotcha. So demons are kind of interesting. Uh, they're explicitly bad and evil. The example one in here is a drug dealer, so, you know, uh, not good. Uh, they're also written to be unlikely or untrustworthy allies because uh, they're also freaking out about this time of reckoning, and they and hell claim to have nothing to do with it, absolutely nothing to do with it. Well, I mean, yeah, but demons lie. That's kind of their whole shtick. So take take their little claims of innocence with a grain of salt. Well, maybe they have a little bit to do with it, but uh, they, they also seem to be freaking out. And then uh, on the other hand, you have the angels, a.k.a. the uh, seraphim, and they do not care about you. Are you one of those uh, society of sentinels uh, with miracles from a divine source? You're nothing. Just a misbehaving child in a world run amok. Yeah, reading this... I, I was super curious if uh, Eric Kripke ever played this game because, dang, I mean, yeah, it's it's right there. It is, it is. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, I know C.J. Carella definitely read Spawn, and this has a uh, a similar vibe to that. And obviously, he, he wrote Nightbane, which also had a lot of Spawn injected into it. Just a smidge, but we're not covering that. Nope, we're not. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of it is. There's a bit of supernatural in this uh, in similar ways, but I feel like that might be reflected in other kind of Gnostic style uh, RPGs and, and sources like Spawn. Spawn's kind of Gnostic in a way. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if Kripke read this or read Spawn or maybe there's some other novel series out there that gave him some inspiration or maybe he came up with it all himself. You know, like it's just one of those ideas whose time had come. Indeed, indeed. Uh, there's also these really cool 80s slasher villains called the Relentless Dead, who are incredibly hard to kill, and they just keep seem to keep coming back. The rulebook gives very specific rules for how to kill them. Uh, you need to send them to negative health and negative essence, which I'm not sure if they really covered negative essence in the game until that point, so that's interesting. And then you need to sever their uh, link between their soul and body with a necromancer. Um, pretty cool uh they're definitely spooky they got a good example uh character in here but i think that the uh they should have given a bit more variety to the method of destruction it should probably be unique for every individual relentless dead because i feel like there's going to be you know each one of these should be very special a very major antagonist for you to be facing and the characters would need to do some research into uh how to defeat it or maybe they'll have to really think on their feet for a uh, effective method or maybe they can't defeat it and they just need to you know pour concrete around its feet and then drop it in the river leave it at the bottom of crystal lake for you know the next generation of lifeguards <laughs> to discover while having sex who knows absolutely <laughs> absolutely so uh yeah the relentless are uh, they're great for a witchcraft one shot i think that's really what they're they're best used for so uh i definitely want to play, play that sometime i think that'd be pretty great and then we got the uh the mad gods so these are lovecraftian wannabes coming out of nowhere from another dimension um and they're implied to be causing or a di direct effect of the time of reckoning. Um, the gods can manifest in our world and wreak havoc, or they can use minions, and they all have the taint, 
which is sort of like in uh, essence antimatter affecting things. It's the evil version of essence. Right. Because they come from a different reality that has different rules. And this is what essence is like there because their reality is garbage and our reality is cool. But what if their reality is cool and ours is actually the garbage one? Can't be. I keep all my stuff in this reality. It's got to be the best one. <laughs> Fair enough. And then finally, there's the uh, Mortal Combine. And the book basically tells you to go out and buy GURPS Illuminati or Conspiracy X for the uh, the second edition. Cross promotion. Right. <laughs> but yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're mortal guys who are trying to keep all this under wraps and therefore bad, um, I guess. I, I don't know. They're c- certainly an antagonist for the witches. Um, but they might actually not be trying to keep things under wraps. They might just have a different agenda that you are brushing up against. Um, so you, they're very nondescript, at least in this source book. Um, so they could go pretty much any direction with them that you want to. And that leads us into the final chapter of our book, chapter eight, Chronicling. It's a really short chapter on how to run the game. Uh, the best bit in here, in my opinion, is the part where it tells you to remember to involve the player characters in the story that you're writing. And I, I truly mean that. I'm not trying to talk down to the rest of the chapter, which is fine. Uh, but I've played in and run games where I or the person who is running it have forgotten to include character hooks. Mm, yeah. That said, in a game like this where the goal is to prevent the literal apocalypse from happening by stopping supernatural predation, you might think, hey, go stop this supernatural predator or the world gets closer to ending could in itself be motivation enough yeah yeah definitely um I, I think you know that's a great point about character hooks and that's also something to keep in mind as a player if you are going to be creating a new character into an ongoing chronicle let's say uh and you you're familiar with it let's say your previous character died or something like that you should uh, create your own hooks and be like hey here's how my character slots in here's how they relate to this conspiracy or this mystery or uh, they're related to these characters that are already in the uh the party um, that really just makes things a lot smoother and uh, uh, makes your character pretty great for the story. Agreed. Mm. And that is the entire book of C.J. Corella's Witchcraft. Indeed. So I think just to uh, wrap things up here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the publication of C.J. Corella's Witchcraft. Um, we we're thinking about doing this at the top, but uh, I think people were probably tuned in just to hear about the game itself. But there's some pretty interesting things to note here. Uh, apparently, the core idea of witchcraft came from Gary Sibley, um, who uh, is a fellow with a few minor credits on RPG Geek uh, from back in the 90s. But CJ Carolla ended up uh, designing the game um, based off of those ideas and gave Gary credit, uh, especially in the uh, the first edition. Gary Sibley's name is in it several times. On uh, the second edition, I couldn't find it, but I think it might be in there once, uh, kind of tucked away somewhere. I assume that they were both playing... Mage the Ascension, and then someone said, or Gary Sibley said, well, what about this, but with more witches and less philosophy? Um, and there could be some truth to that, because C.J. Carella is listed as a playtester for GURPS Mage the Ascension, so we know he at least played it a little bit. Witchcraft was also published uh, just a few months before 1996's The Craft, which was uh, great timing for it, uh, but unfortunately there was trouble with the first publisher, uh, Myrmidon Press. So none of the source books that CJ had already wrote got published. Uh, Luckily, Eden Studios saved the day and uh, eventually published a second edition in uh, 1999. Uh, Witchcraft second edition had a few books associated with it. It had a ST screen with an adventurer. Uh, There was the Mystery Codex that we mentioned, which has the potentially problematic uh, Storm Dragons. I actually haven't read it, but I'm a little leery. Uh, about those guys. Uh, there was also the Abomination Codex, which had lycanthropes and vampires. And then there was uh, one splat book for the uh, Rosicrucians. Uh, there was also the Book of Hod. I don't know what that is. Clearly, they chose the correct group to have a splat book. The Rosicrucians <laughs> are objectively the best. So, yeah, I see that the the designer and publisher agreed with me. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, I, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, obviously, the the witches or the, the wiki or like the the intended uh, core player characters. So I wonder why they didn't come out with that one first. My theory on the subject is okay. that it's because the entire book makes itself 
goes above and beyond to prove that this is the people you're supposed to be playing so we can put aside giving them a source book Mm. because obviously they're the good ones why would you need any prodding to play them here's this other group that is you know boring and adult and full of rules and regulations we should probably make it clearer why you'd want to play them yeah that could be a good point and then obviously they have much more structure in society so they wanted to detail that and really give more background on uh, on how that all works so yeah maybe that's why they went with the uh the rosicrucians um or they're just the best uh, it could be could be uh one interesting thing about witchcraft uh is that you know it has the time of reckoning which is an impending doomsday uh like many other horror heartbreakers at that time but what i think sets witchcraft apart is that a linked apocalyptic rpg called armageddon the end times was released just a year later armageddon is supposed to be one of the many possible time of reckoning situations for the gifted if they fail uh to keep things under control So I think that's pretty neat. You know, long before we had the end times um, for uh, uh, World of Darkness, for example, uh, witchcraft just did it. They're just like, hey, let's just show you what the end times would be like if you want to play that or lead into it from a witchcraft game. I don't have that book. It's very expensive. If you want to get the second edition, it's like 100 bucks. Um, PDFs are cheaper. But... I don't know how linked it is. Certainly the um, the mad god who who takes over uh, and starts to destroy the world is the one who's described in witchcraft. Uh, I forget the name of it. Um, and it's some made up Lovecraft. Yeah, name. Shub, it's, it's, it's a Shub something, but not not the uh, problematic name. Uh, so there is some some tentative links. I think the character is much more like holy angelic warrior types or they can be mundanes just like in witchcraft you can just have a mundane guy with uh with an m16 or something trying to shoot strange creatures so there's multiple levels of play basically but uh it's kind of neat and then i think <laughs> the other neat thing about witchcraft is that, is that it's literally been free on on drive through rpg for the past 20 years so if you haven't gotten it yet we're gonna link it in the show notes if you go to darker-days.org you can see the little witchcraft uh, picture right there just click on that it'll take you to drive through rpg you can get this for free there's no reason not to check it out um and i think that leads into two important questions first off chig what's your favorite thing and least favorite thing about cj corella's witchcraft uh we've covered this already my favorite thing is the rosicrucians <laughs> they know what they're doing mm. they got it together they are objectively going to win this fight for reality. Sure. Uh, my least favorite thing is the um, the fact that the groups don't really get along very well. Mm. Like, yeah. yeah, you could in theory have a member of uh, any group that has any of the arts, but they are strongly pushing you to very clearly choose if you're going to be in this group you should probably choose the art that they are meant to represent right yeah what about you what's your favorite and least favorite i think least favorite i would probably do the similar thing with the uh the groups that you mentioned um because that was you know, i was reading through this and i was really hoping that they wouldn't fall into that trap of uh keeping them kind of the same um but then they obviously did but i think i'm actually going to say for least favorite i think the uh, special abilities for these different associations are kind of boring you know you mentioned that they're basically just bonuses for the thing that they're already supposed to be doing anyway that particular art uh i think it could have really spiced them up i think that having all of them have a bonus and a drawback would have been good and especially would have made them a diff- bit different than uh one of the solitaires right maybe solitaire should have had no bonus whatsoever but yeah you don't have a drawback so that's kind of why you might uh end up in that sort of uh as that kind of character because you don't want to uh, have that drawback and also for like story reasons um favorite thing Ooh, you actually, can say the best. It's okay. I, w- I won't judge no, you. No, no, it's, not, it's not. My other, my other least favorite thing I was going to say was uh, I think the Combine are just kind of just a waste of pages. They could have really put more ideas into that. Uh, or it could have been just a paragraph, basically. It, 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 was, it, was, a, it was like a two, three page nothing burger for me. Uh, favorite thing. Uh, I'm going to go with the Relentless 
dead. Uh, I think they're just really fun, cool, easy to port into another RPG. Obviously, there's like Slashers and uh, Hunter the Vigil and other games, but I just like the way they're represented here as being this kind of just rage-filled, uh, possessed body, basically, that uh, is wreaking havoc. Uh, in this uh, this time of reckoning, so I'm going to go with them. I will give them points for not requiring, but really kind of pushing to. If you want to defeat one of those got one of the uh, the relentless dead, you're gonna need multiple splats because you gotta yeah. you gotta take them down physically, you gotta take them down magically, and you gotta take them down necromantically, and mm. there's. As, as written here, there's not one group that's going to be able to just pull in. All right, we got our necromancer, we got our magic guy, we got our big tough dude. We're going to send these guys out to just take down every Jason Voorhees we can find. So, yeah, great point. Yeah, that's a really great point, yeah. Chig, do you have a question for me now? Would you play this game? Would you sit down at a table and play C.J. Carella's very own witchcraft? Chig? I have already offered to. At the end of my recent D&D session that you heard about at the beginning of this episode, I said, hey guys, I just read this game Witchcraft. You want to check it out? You want to play as spooky witches? And Chig, they said yes. That's right. We're going to play a horror heartbreaker. Meanwhile, Chig. Nice. Would you play CJ Carilla's very own Witchcraft? second edition? I would absolutely play Witchcraft. I was reading this book and I'm like... <laughs> Oh, man, I, I wish it was worse because it'd be easier to make fun of. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. And aside from a couple of little problematic things that we pointed out that we could just very easily skip over. Yeah, I would 100% play this game. Yeah, it's the crazy thing. You know, we didn't mention this, but uh, Witchcraft 2nd Edition has almost no changes from 1st Edition. Same art, uh, basically same mechanics, a few little tweaks here and there, but pretty much the same thing. And when I read that, at the beginning, I was like, oh, man, you didn't change anything with this. But reading through, I'm like, no, I mean, this is all pretty good. This all this all kind of just works. You didn't really need to change it. It's not it's not really broken. Um, so I think it's really cool. Uh, Jake, a suggestion for me, you know, might be to check out that Rosicrucian book and see if you can if you ever play uh, Mage the Ascension again. You could port them right in if you think they're cool and don't take up too much of the uh, Order of Hermes is uh, space right there i'm pretty sure all the supplements are also on drive through so i'm gonna have to go look through those and see what's there yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah good stuff good stuff and uh yeah that is the end to this uh horror heartbreaker uh it, it turned out to be another positive one again you know same thing kind of happened with nightbane we made fun of that one a bit more but cj curl is just a good writer and good designer there's uh there's only so much we can uh we can tease for this one but uh, stay tuned. Maybe sometime in the future we'll come back with another horror heartbreaker, which is uh, a bit goofier. But you never know. There can't be that many out there. <laughs> Surely. <laughs> <laughs> How many are on my shelf? All right. So, yeah. So in closing, we are Dark Days Radio. Uh, we've got lots of different social media. You can check it out at Linktree slash Darker Days Radio. Um, but we especially want to... Uh, send you towards our discord because uh it's where i hang out the most i don't really use a lot of other social media maybe blue sky on occasion um and that is a great way to uh get in touch with us uh we definitely want feedback we've had a lot of uh, episodes going up on youtube so if you're a, a youtube listener definitely uh stop by and say hi or if you're one of those like ridiculous number of spotify listeners we have right now uh also drop us a line uh definitely want to hear about how you uh how you found us and uh what kind of games you're playing really excited to hear about other people's rpgs uh chig anything else you want to bring up for this episode in closing no i think we covered it very well so hey listeners it's a dark world out there stay safe dang straight and to all the listeners out there take it easy and have a good night This has been an episode of Darker Days Radio. Special thanks to Occam's Laser for the intro, outro, and new bumper music from their hit album, Nine Circles. Check out the rest of their work at occamslaser.bandcamp.com. Occam's Laser.